I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. We're going to protect Christianity. As the midterm elections approach, white evangelical Christians are a key part of the Republican coalition and have stuck with the president through a series of scandals. Do you care if your president had an affair before he was president? No. 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 I believe he's president of the United States for a reason. I think God put him there. But 40 years ago, evangelicals were at the margins of American politics. I think the decision was made in 1979 that it was okay to be just like every other citizen and to get involved in politics. We think of evangelicals today as a major force in American society and certainly in American politics, but in the mid-1970s, they weren't. Evangelicals were not involved in politics, certainly not in in any organized way. Many were not even registered to vote. Uh, They considered politics dirty and uh, kind of beneath them. Until Jimmy Carter came along. Jimmy Carter's 1976 presidential campaign put faith at the center of the national conversation. He read the Bible every night, taught Sunday school, and had occasionally preached at Robert Maddox's church. Questions were coming up about what kind of religion he had, and he said, well, I'm a born-again Christian. The most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. And all throughout the press and everybody else wanted to know what in the world that was, what kind of magic, what kind of... of uh, a charade would he have gone through? We have checked on the religious meaning, uh, meaning of Carter's profound experience. It is described by other Baptists as a common experience, not something out of the ordinary. Being reborn does not mean having a vision or hearing the voice of God. The press seized on this and uh, made a big deal out of it. But for evangelical voters, it was an important moment to have a presidential candidate talk openly about his faith. It was staggering. As much as any American, Jimmy Carter made it respectable to be born again. It does seem to be a yearning for some kind of spiritual revival in this country. And planned or not, it could turn out that Jimmy Carter's religion will be a net plus. I believe that I can be a better president 
if I am elected because of my faith. Carter would become known as the first evangelical president. Thank you very much for having me get here and being the president of the greatest country on earth. But two years into Carter's term, Reverend Maddox, now working at the White House, met with a group of preachers and got a surprising reaction. Immediately, from the floor, just erupted. Catcalls and boos and, and, you know, fists were shaking. He has told us he's religious and he's not. I got back to the White House and began to say, friends, we've got a big problem out there. For me and for many other evangelicals, there was a disconnect between uh, his personal faith and uh, public policy. It turned out that some of Carter's policies were more liberal than many evangelicals had hoped for. From a political standpoint, uh, they were turned off. One of his top aides was the woman who argued the Roe versus Wade case before the Supreme Court. Uh, he had a White House conference on families, plural, and included uh, gays and lesbians. If you look at the world from the perspective of an evangelical Christian, you have Roe versus Wade. We no longer pray in school. You have desegregation of Christian colleges and academies. All of these things come together and create a great deal of fear about the loss of some kind of Christian nation. That I believe in freedom of choice also, but I believe you ought to make the choice before you go to bed and can commit sin. Reverend Jerry Falwell would become the most well-known of a new movement of conservative preachers who wanted a strong defense policy abroad and traditional values at home. We believe when a man marries a woman, she is his obligation for life. It was a movement that harnessed the power of television. Televangelism really erupted in the 1970s, and uh, Jerry Falwell was riding that wave. Jerry Falwell turned a small Virginia church of 35 into a Christian's communications empire. A Virginia television preacher with an audience of millions. As the 1980 election approached, Falwell stepped directly into politics and formed an alliance with a group of political operatives, including Paul Weyrich. Weyrich uh, makes a statement saying that there really is a moral majority of voters out there that need to be tapped, need to be organized. And Falwell says, I think that's what we should call this new movement. We should call it Moral Majority. It's a political action committee registered as such, just like those of labor unions or any other organization. A new political machine that's anti-abortion, anti-ERA, anti-gay rights, and for what he calls a moral America. Cal Thomas, a journalist in Washington, went to work for Falwell. He invited me down to Lynchburg, Virginia, saying we're going to lead a movement that's going to change America. Now, who couldn't be involved in something like that? We were hoping to accomplish the political organization of evangelicals, fundamentalists, conservative Jews, and uh, conservative Catholics into a large uh, voting bloc that would uh, elect like-minded people to public office and restore a sense of patriotism and love for the country. We can, and so help us God, we will make America great again. The candidate they backed was a twice-married former Hollywood actor who signed a liberal abortion law as California governor. There was a great deal of reservation about Ronald Reagan. God put us here for some reason. The turning point was a gathering of a group called the Religious Roundtable. I'm sick and tired of hearing about all of the radicals and the perverts and the liberals and the leftists and the communists coming out of the closets. It's time for God's people to come out of the closets, out of the churches, and change America. And uh, Reagan stood up and he said famously, I know no, this group can't, can't endorse, endorse me. me. But I only brought that up because I want you to know that I endorse you and what you are doing. That rippled throughout uh, churches and religious establishments throughout the country. It was like, come up out of the catacombs, you know. You don't have to be silent anymore. As in no election passed, the evangelical right wing is up in arms, out in force this year. 175,000 worshipers sang, prayed, and marched around the Capitol Mall. They said their purpose was to call the national leadership back to God. We have a threefold primary responsibility. Number one, get people saved. Number two, get them baptized. Number three, get them registered to vote. They hadn't participated in the political life of the country for a long time. And Jerry gave them permission to do that again. 
Reagan and the Republicans pledged to appoint pro-life judges and support prayer in public school. For really the first time in any significant way, evangelicalism becomes interlocked with the Republican Party. Looking at the Democratic platform and the things that, that um, Jimmy Carter supports, I'm, I'm not sure that Jesus Christ, I'm, well, I know that Christ would not support that platform. I, Ronald Reagan. But in the end, swear, Reagan didn't follow through on many of the issues evangelicals cared about. Cal Thomas, who left Moral Majority after a few years, came to feel that the organization was too concerned with maintaining access and that political influence wasn't the best way to change the country. Evangelicals like George Bush, they liked Ronald Reagan, they have liked other Republicans in the past, but they never seemed to be able to close the deal on the issues that evangelicals care about. In the long term, things have not really fundamentally changed. They've gotten worse in their view. Uh, We've gone from same-sex marriage to transgenderism, 60 million abortions. Our Christian heritage will be cherished, protected. And then along comes Donald Trump, the antithesis of everything that evangelicals stand for. Multiple affairs, crude language, you name it. And uh, a lot of them, them have made a bargain that uh, it didn't matter anymore. Dad explained that when he walked into the voting booth, he wasn't electing a Sunday school teacher or a pastor. It was just as tough a sell with evangelicals to get them to vote for somebody like Ronald Reagan, who had been married twice, as it was for me to get people to vote and support Trump. Um, it, it was the same dynamic. It's like history repeated itself. Today, Jerry Falwell Jr. leads the university his father founded and has emerged as a prominent evangelical voice in support of President Trump. I think Jesus has made it clear that you use your common sense and your God-given brain to decide who will be the best political leader. I don't look to the teachings of Jesus for what my political beliefs should be. I don't think he wanted us to. Remember the attack on Mary We need somebody tough. We need somebody who has the right position on the issues. He promised to appoint strong conservatives to the federal courts at every level. And President Trump came through. He appointed Jesus. He's not only done everything he said he was going to do, but he's um, done more. The president is preparing to reveal his decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The announcement fulfills a campaign promise for President Trump and is popular among evangelical Christians. I think he's going to be, end up being our greatest president since George Washington. While Trump still has the support of more than 70 percent of white evangelicals, some worry that what started as a religious movement is now seen as just another political constituency. The evangelicals are missing a greater point. If you're not careful, the political activism overwhelms the primary message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only thing that is able to truly change a life and by extension, uh, change a nation. And no politician can fill that role. Shannon. Okay, so tell us about this dinner. I understand the president talked about your support, evangelical support of him, and what he's tried to do in return. Well, he did. And, you know, I guess the headline from the evening would be evangelicals remain enthusiastically supportive of President Trump. And, uh, you know, the headlines that we've all seen recently, I knew they wouldn't affect my support of the president, but I did wonder how it might affect some others in the room. Well, the answer is there's no effect. I mean, this was a beautiful state dinner or organized by the First Lady, but it all, almost turned into a campaign rally. I mean, leader after leader stood up and spontaneously started talking about why they supported President Trump. And Shannon, I know a lot of people are still perplexed. Why are Christians mm -hmm. so supportive of Donald Trump? Well, it's really not that hard to figure out when you realize he is the most pro-life, pro-religious liberty, pro-conservative judiciary in history, and that includes either Bush or Ronald Reagan. I think that's why evangelicals remain committed to this president, and they're not going to turn away from him soon. Yeah, I mean, August polling that we have just, you know, within days, it said, do you approve or disapprove of the job Donald Trump is doing as president? White evangelicals said this, approve 74%. 25% disapprove, uh, don't know, 2%. That is a resounding yes from that particular group. But you do understand 
the questioning, the criticism from people who say, this is not what you would ever do as a leader of your church. You would preach against much of what the president's done in his life. As I campaigned across the country, faith leaders explained that they were prevented from speaking their minds because of a 1954 rule known as the Johnson Amendment. I spoke about it a lot. Under this rule, if a pastor, priest, or imam speaks about issues of public or political importance, they are threatened with the loss of their tax-exempt status, a crippling financial punishment, very, very unfair. In just a few moments, I will be signing an executive order to follow through on that pledge and to prevent the Johnson Amendment from interfering with your First Amendment rights. And you're the people I want to listen to. Other people are allowed to tell me and everybody what to do. I want to hear it from you. And so do a lot of other people. So you're now in a position where you can say what you want to say. And I know you'll only say good and you'll say what's in your heart. And that's what we want from you. You are great, great people. You are great, great people. Thank you. Thank you. This executive order directs the IRS not to unfairly target churches and religious organizations for political speech. No one should be censoring sermons or targeting pastors. In America, we do not fear people speaking freely from the pulpit. We embrace it. We are giving our churches their voices back. We are giving them back in the highest form. With this executive order, we also make clear that the federal government will never, ever penalize any person for their protected religious beliefs. In this auditorium, yes, sir the Lord and Donald Trump, we can talk about these things in church That's on right. Sunday morning. That's right. That's right. That's right. You've been a part of the Faith <coughs> Advisory Council that was assembled together. Um, James Robinson had a part in that. A number of ministers, nationally known ministers, have been a part of that. What would you say that would be most interest to our Christian audience, especially the faith audience? that you've heard in those meetings, those phone calls, uh, that gives you the most hope and what you're listening for, what was your ear tuned to that you've heard out of that that was the most encouraging thing as a Christian? Terry, I believe the thing that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, not, is not so much what was said in the conversations in those meetings, but the fact that we were having them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I yeah. have no doubt at this point, from what I've what I've heard, what I've seen uh, that's taken place uh, the, over the last month that, that this has been happening. Um, if something were to really, really strike my heart, if God really showed me something that I felt like, <clears throat> and, and that the Lord would say, "You deliver this." Yeah. Yeah. I have no doubt but what I could deliver it. <laughs> and that was not true in presidents past. Mm -hmm. Even though we had influence in, in, uh, in, in some areas, in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. But if the Lord were to say something to me in the other presidents that what little I've had to do with them, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know whether it could have ever gotten anybody to listen to me or not. But I am totally convinced that if the Lord were to say something to me, if mm -hmm. the Lord were to say mm -hmm. something to David, or if the Lord were to say something to Bishop that, that, that the president needs to hear, <clears throat> I have yeah. no doubt yeah. that we could do it and do it quickly. Yes, sir. And have audience to say, thus saith the Lord, and, and he wouldn't just turn it over to an aide or something and just write it off. He would listen, and, and it would mean something to him. Israeli newspaper, Alabama's anti-abortion law, this is what Christian rule looks like in America. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like. 
we Christians are standing up and we are going to impose Christian rule in this country. And Ms. Cohen, we Christians are standing up. We are going to impose Christian values in America again, whether you like it or not.